Next up, uh, we have a keynote by Bruce Schneider around why securing society actually means hacking society. And a hacker mindset applies not only to socio-technical system, as Bruce says, but also to purely social systems as well. Tax loopholes, for example, or the disinformation campaign that our democracy has suffered from in the last years. Bruce Schneider is an internationally renowned security technologist. The Economist actually calls him the security guru. Uh, he's a New York Times bestselling author of 14 books, including, and I like this title, Click Here to Kill Everybody. I mean, it's definitely a polarizing one, uh, as well as hundreds of articles, essays, and academic papers. His influential newsletter, Cryptogram, uh, and his blog on security are read by over 250,000 people. And he's a fellow at Harvard University and a lecturer in public policy at the Harvard Kennedy School. Ladies and gentlemen, a warm welcome to Bruce Schneider. There he is. Hi, Bruce. Thanks for your patience. Hey there. Thank you very much for your patience. I'll, uh, I'll leave you the stage. We're having some Thank odd you. technical issues, so I actually can't speak. We're going to go with that. Where that is. Uh, so yes, I did hear the interview, and I do want to talk about hacking broader society. And uh, a really good example is is the tax code. Right, the tax code is code. It's an algorithm. It gets a bunch of inputs and it has outputs, the amount of money you owe, uh, right? Those are the rules of tax. It has vulnerabilities. We call them tax loopholes. It has exploits. In the United States, those are called tax avoidance strategies. And there are black hat hackers, and they are, we call them tax attorneys, whose job it is to find vulnerabilities that can be exploited. And that's a way to think about, about hacking. And so a definition might be something the system permits, but is unanticipated and unwanted by the designers. Or uh, a clever, unintended exploitation of a system, which one, subverts the rules or norms of that system, two, at the expense of some other part of that system. And so that's my hacking definition. It's a real subjective term. It encompasses a notion of cleverness and, and subtlety. It's an exploitation version. It's unintended, unanticipated. Hack follow the rules of a system, but divert its goal or intent. So hacks are perpetrated on system. And to me, a system is some interconnected set of rules or norms designed for some purpose. Think of the tax code. Lots of different laws designed to figure out how much people should owe. You know, design might, might not be the right word. There isn't always a designer. The tax, tax code in most countries uh, evolved, was assembled over the decades, uh, centuries. You know, intent or purpose, right? Uh, the purpose of the tax, the intent of the tax. So maybe more like functionality. But these are kind of you know, good ways we can start. I'm okay with an imprecise definition. And they're very general definition. Systems, of course, the tax code, but we could talk about hacks against the market economy, our system of passing laws, our system of choosing legislators and leaders. You know, in the United States, we're going to have a rash of lawsuits. Many of them will be hacks against our electoral system, our cognitive. So this is my big idea. We normally think of hackers as countercultural loners going up against these big, powerful systems. More often, the hacks are the rich and powerful themselves, subverting systems to increase their own power. And hacking is how systems are subverted, but also how systems evolve. And I think this hack framework is a useful way to understand and maybe solve these problems in our broader social systems. So to this end, I have 11 general observations. Uh, one, hacking is ubiquitous. Right? All systems can be hacked. Computer and computerized systems, yes, but also professional sports, consumer reward programs, economic, political, social systems, our cognitive functions. Right? A system isn't just 
a set of rules. It could be norms. It could be biological processes. And even the most thought out sets of rules are incomplete and inconsistent. They right? have, have ambiguities, things the designers haven't thought of yet. Or maybe the world around the system changes, making new hacks possible. The more complex the system is, the more hackable vulnerabilities it'll have. And as long as there are people who want to subvert the goals of a the system, there will be hacks. People are originality machines. Hacks are a normal part of a creative process. And we can talk about hacks against systems. Right? ATM machines. It's a computer system, but it's also a system of distributing money. We have decades of history of hacks against those. Hacks against airline frequent flyer plans. And when I used to fly, we used to do, we talk about things like mileage runs, which are low-cost trips to maximize the miles you get for some purpose. And there are lots of stories of people who have hacked different aspects of the airline frequent flyer plans. The United States, the pudding guy, 1999, uh, ended up buying, I'm not making this up, 12,000 single cups of pudding at 25 cents each, giving him 1.2 million miles for $3,000, right, which, which is an enormously good deal. And that was, you know, that was a hack. Uh, casino games. There have been hacks against all casino games. You can think of uh, roulette computers or the MIT group's card counting. Hacks uh, out of sports. Lots of rule changes as a result of hack. Uh, curving hockey sticks, Formula One racing, American basketball. A uh, second point is that hacks are parasitical. Right? Hackers are trying to subvert the goal of the system to their own private gain at the expense of the rest of the system. They try to gain some advantage for themselves. But a sort of interesting corollary is that they need to rely on the system in order for their hack to function. If the system fails, the hack fails. And so if you are hacking airline frequent flyer program or a casino game, if that frequent flyer program is canceled, if the casino game is taken off the casino floor, your hack no longer works. So it's a parasitical system, and like any parasite, it can't kill its host. Now, this isn't necessarily evil. Like people are behaving rationally, behaving in their self-interest, financial self-interest, but also emotional, social, political, ethical, sometimes out of necessity, looking for opportunities. And we can see lots of uh, hacks against uh, finance, against banking in the United States, lots of uh, financial regulations, financial exchanges, insider trading, front running, high frequency trading, hedge funds are basically one hack after the other. Third point is that hacks often become normalized. Right? When we think of hacks, we think of them being quickly blocked by the designers. Right? There's a hack in Windows and it's patched. And that's really true for computer systems. It's not really true as much in this generalization. There's a longer and less formal process. Uh, the hack is discovered and used. It becomes more popular. Some governing system learns about it. And then they either change the system to prevent the hack or they incorporate the hack into the system. They normalize the hack. This doesn't often happen. This doesn't always happen deliberately. Sometimes it happens through inaction. But this is the way hacks are normalized. And a lot of the things we think of as normal started out as hacks. I mean, hedge funds and banking and finance are, are a good example of that. That a lot of the hacks that were discovered became a normal part of finance, became a normal part of banking. Either they were retroactively declared legal or they were just not prosecuted long enough that they became okay. Or, or hacks against our political system. In the United States, uh, whether you give Supreme Court justices a hearing. That was a hack done a couple of years ago. Now it's probably a new normal. Uh, monopolies are a hack. Too big to fail is a hack. Right? The concept that some corporations are so important to the functioning of our society that they can't be allowed to fail. And that is a way for companies to take advantage of a system to privatize gains and socialize losses. The United States, too big to fail, has a history in the 1970s in the Chrysler Corporation. 2008, 
and the financial crisis. Okay? And, and it's an emergent vulnerability. When the, when the mechanisms of the market economy were invented, nothing could be possibly be that big. Now something can, and it's a hack. VC funding is a hack of market economics. And markets are based on knowledgeable buyers making decisions against competing products. Right? The whole idea is that pressure to sell to those buyers decreases prices and sets innovation. And VC money hijacks that process. It's an internal injection of, of capital that companies don't have to compete for in the traditional manner. So now you have startups where the best strategy is to take enormous risks because if you don't, you'll, you'll die. Your funding will run out. And companies can destroy without providing a viable alternative. Uber and Lyft are good examples of that. And Uber is totally a hack. Right? Even now, they make 41 cents in every dollar they charge you. They've never made a profit. They're destroying the taxi industry. They just uh, spent a lot of money in California lobbying to make sure that uh, their drivers, not co they're not employees. So this is my fourth point about money. Right? We normally think of hacking as something the disempowered do against powerful systems. But it's more common that the wealthy hack system for their own advantage. And they're better able to discover hacks because they can devote more resources to the process. They can buy expertise. They're better able to leverage hacks. They have more money. And their hacks are more likely to become normalized because the wealthy can influence whatever, dis whatever system makes that decision. So we can look at hacking laws, the lead process, hacking regulations, Airbnb and Uber, and different ways jurisdictions interact. My fifth point is that hacking is a way of exerting power. Hacking is a mechanism to gain personal power. And the disempowered do it by subverting existing power structures to bypass bureaucracy and lots of Lots of the world has no choice in the global systems that affect their lives. So they have no choice but to hack them. And people always hack systems that cause them problems. But the powerful also do it to increase their own power and to influence the evolution of a system in their own favor. And there's a difference here. Right? The disempowered are often faster at hacking, and the powerful are more effective at hacking. And in our society, money equals power. So again, monopolies, too big to fail, VC funding. And today, powerful hackers usually win. Right? Hacking legislation, lots of examples of ways you can hack legislation. In the United States, you, it, could be, it could be slipping things into must-pass uh, bills. That happens a lot in the United States. Hidden provisions, you know, laws that no one really knows what they do. Automatic lawmaking, it's a way you, you hide the fact that you're making a law. Delaying legislation. Lots of countries have delaying tactics that, that are hacks. And my sixth point is that context matters when you evaluate a hack. And we, we have a very negative definition of hacks, but the context matters. Hacks subvert the intent of a system, but that's not always a bad thing. Some hacks are beneficial. They're innovations. And in order to decide whether you normalize a hack, you need to consider the context. Is a subverted system better? Is it an unethical system that you're subverting? So who gets to define intent and decide is really important. It's easy when there's a singular designer, when it's Microsoft Windows and it's Microsoft. Even for a sport, there's a governing body for uh, football and, and Formula One racing and basketball and hockey. And there's some notion of a good game that's entertaining human competition. But this is harder when systems have multiple designers or have evolved, like the tax code or the market economy or democracy. They rarely have single intents or goals, and there's a legitimate difference in the opinion of the optimal functioning of a system, which leads to different answers about what to do about a hack. And since we're in a system that's evolved, no one is actually right. So you think about the filibuster, administrative burdens, blocking Supreme Court nominees in the United States. So point seven, hacking is how systems develop, adapt, and evolve. Right? Hacking is about finding novel failure modes. And when they actually work, they have unexpected outcomes. They can be positive. 
And, and generally, hacks are either legal or declared illegal by more general systems. So if you hack a sport, the governing body will decide. If you hack the tax code, the tax authority will decide. And systems can evolve in this manner. Now, if there's no governing body, you need some way to decide to adjudicate a hack. And the, the system of, of default is the court system. Right? Judges deciding whether hacks should be normalized and what should be prohibited. And that is some way that we incorporate hacks into our systems and they evolve. Right? There's an optimal level of hacking for a system. It's not zero. An evolution in the face of hacking can be faster and more efficient than doing it in a traditional manner. I think that's really important. And we can look at, like, look at hacks against democracy in this way. Gerrymandering in the United States, money in politics, misinformation. These are all hacks against democracy. Uh, point eight is that systems can be hacked to destruction. When hacks are parasitical, then too much of the parasite destroys the underlying system. If there are too many hacks against ATM machines, there'll be no more ATM machines. We saw some of that in the United States in the 2008 banking crisis and with money in politics, political disinformation. These, these, these are hacks that are threatening to destroy the underlying systems. You see this happen in a political uh, revolution. So while hacking can be a good thing, you can't be too much of it too quickly. And how flexible a, uh, a system is matters here. Right? A rigid system can break if you hack it. A resilient system can evolve. And then, of course, there are some immoral systems that need to be hacked. Systems of oppression. Systems of discrimination. That you need to hack in order to fix them. And then we can think about hacking cognitive systems. Right? There's an adage in computer security that script kiddies hack computers while smart attackers attack hack people. And lots of hackers hack people. Advertising. Targeted advertising is a hack against our cognitive system. Behavioral advertising. Social media hacks our attention. Terrorism attacks fear. Lots of things attack our systems of trust. You could look at a lot of things that happened in the U.S. election in the past six months, a year, as hack against systems of fear and trust and safety and tribalism. And generally, junk food hacks our biological systems of food desirability. Right? Our, our system is based on a 100,000-year-old environment and dietary habit, not on modern processed food. So the change in the threat model led to a vulnerability. Point nine, there's a hierarchy of hacking and of systems. Right? So it's rarely a single system here. It's a nested group of systems. And, and you can hack it different ways. Right? Imagine someone wants to pay less tax. 